So it's interesting, uh, our, is everybody a master's level student? So who's, so we're on, master, who's, who's, who's on the MSW track? Okay. And we're working on PhD. All right, all right, Fa faculty members. All right, faculty. All right, I think the faculty uh, of the team might win this game. Uh, uh, undergrads? All right, nice, nice. Uh, so uh, I'd say the first uh, the, the first thing as an adult I'll say first thing as an adult that uh, I really thought I was going to do in my life was be a social worker um, in, in the area of child welfare. So my undergrad degree was in sociology with minor in criminal justice, uh, but I have kind of more of a service orientation and a research orientation. You know, I, I, I enjoy it. I still enjoy research, but I also wanted to have my feet on the ground. And also really had uh, kind of heart for kids. So as an undergrad at Old Dominion University, I worked a semester-long internship with Child Protective Services of Northern Virginia. Um, interesting that they had never taken on an undergrad intern. They had only had MSW candidates there prior to me. Um, but, but I was insistent. That was what I wanted to do. I really wanted to be on the ground and, and see what things were like. And so. In some ways, it was interesting. I think to scare me off the trail, they put me with one of the members of their crisis team. So I got to accompany uh, Mary Walter, my supervisor, to sexual assault scenes, um, to very significant deprivation scenes. Um, and after six months of that, they had to scare me off the trail. I, I thought, no, working with kids with me is still really what I'm about. Um, so I started a master's degree at the University of Texas in Austin in the fall of 1995 uh, in social work um, and, and for a, a various set of personal and financial reasons. Uh, that didn't work out, um, but I, I came here to Athens to sort of reorient. And part of that reorientation was um, kind of going laterally kind of into education. So ultimately, Ended up getting a, group, a master's degree in education here uh, in social science ed. Uh, uh, began my teaching career not teaching social studies and not teaching high school kids, which is what I thought I was going to do, uh, but teaching language arts to seventh graders. Uh, and, you know, if you have sensed the theme already, there's this idea that no, two years hence does not hold what you think it was going to hold, uh, which is you know something I try to hang on to in life and just remind myself all the time. Um, uh, but, but I uh, I really thought like, man, the school kids are interesting. I mean, 
they, they rode roughshod over me for a couple of years. I, I think I still got like scars on my forehead <laughs> uh, that rolling over me. Um, but I transitioned into teaching history to eighth graders, so I was actually in my discipline. Uh, taught Georgia history for a couple of years to eighth graders. And then when Classic City High School, which is the sort of small, non-traditional public school opened here in Athens, I was one of the first group teachers there in the fall of 2003. So I taught uh, government and economics and a service learning class there for about seven years. And then the principal at the time uh, decided to move his, with his wife out to the coast, and so that left an opening there. And in the interim, I came back to school here in I guess, 2005 and six uh, to get a uh, graduate certificate in educational leadership. Uh, so I was credentialed. And so I was then principal of Classic City for four years. Uh, immediately after that, went to do kind of comparable work with the Foothills Charter High School group, which is the regional public evening school in this part of the state. And so uh, Foothills teaches high school classes to kids who are working during the day just to keep lights on in the house, taking care of ailing family members, uh, kids who don't jihad with the system, or not down with the man, and, um, and, and just need a smaller, more flexible environment. And so uh, kind of over the four years I was with them, we grew from seven sites to 16 sites. And uh, that now includes not only just open public evening high school classroom areas like here in Clark and Jackson and Madison and down in Milledgeville and out in Long County, um, but also includes teaching high school classes at three state prisons, uh, women's prison north of here, two men's prisons. Um, and then they also teach classes now that I'm gone um, uh, at three uh, Georgia National Guard facilities where the Guard has this sort of residential program for 16 to 18 year olds who kind of need something very specialized. Um, so, in my role there as the student services director, I supported social workers and guidance counselors and mentors and career coaches and, and a handful of other folks. Um, I guess about 12 years ago, after some time in public ed, feeling like, oh, I love these families, I love these kids, I love the chance to interact with them, I get a lot out of them, I mean, I always will tell anybody who asks. I always got more from working with kids than I knew they ever could have gotten from me. Um, you know, I decided, you know, I'd kind of like to have like a more macro level opportunity. Um, and yeah, I'd been interested in public policy making and politics, I guess, small p, uh, for a while. And uh, there was an open seat on the county commission here. Uh, a gentleman had left to run for mayor unsuccessfully. Uh, but I engaged with some friends of mine and said, you know, what, what, what do you think? It would be like if I ran for this county commission seat and a couple people just got wide-eyed and excited. And so that got me excited and I thought, all right, I'm going to do it. And um, lo and behold, I served three terms on the county commission and concurrent with my time in public ed. And uh, probably knew for at least five years that when a mayoral opening came up, I was going to run for mayor. Uh, you know, just to be in that key seat around you know, long-range planning and community conversation. Um, so uh, ran last year and was successful there and so started office on January 8th, so uh, not even three months ago. Um, and I'll say, you know, you, you may, might sit here now and think, no, public office would never be for me, running for office sure as hell would not be for me, uh, but never say never. Um, uh, because I'll say it's a really rewarding experience. You, you get to have great conversations. You get to do both some sort of granular planning as well as some big picture things. And if you enjoy kind of engaging with lots of different partners and not sort of just staying in your lane, it's a great place to not stay in your lane, but in fact draw other people into your lane where, you know, at least in my mind, in my way of thinking, you can get more done than you get just by yourself as one institution, one organization. So what is that stuff? What is that stuff uh, that I'm looking to get done? Uh, a fair bit of that is really kind of around the intersection of economic health and community health. Um, so it's, it's of no surprise to anyone who knows Athens or towns like Athens that, you know, historically there's been this big gulf. <coughs> Some folks doing fantastically well, and then a lot of folks doing fantastically poorly. And 
I, I tell a lot of people that that actually makes us in a better spot than lots of other places. Um, two years, three years ago, I did a bunch of staff development and public aid in southeast Georgia. And there are a bunch of communities down there that only have one half of that gulf. Mm -hmm. They got the folks who are doing poorly and they've got no community wealth or no new investment. You know, high school kids who do well in those communities leave and they never come back. Um, businesses start and they fold. They don't grow, they fold. Or they leave. And so the fact that we've got a community here that has got some wealth and has some enormous assets puts us in a great position to say we can bridge that divide because there are the dollars and there are the skills and there's the enthusiasm for bridging that divide. You know, one of the great things in Athens is there's this great part from people in the business sector, um, you know, on campus here, uh, you know, people in the arts community who've done very well, to, to see that gulf bridged. Now, that looks differently to different people and so sometimes there are dicey conversations around that. Um, but overall, kind of my hope is that we were having a conversation about Athens 10 years from now. Those parts of town where geographically people have not been invested in, become invested in. Those parts of town where people have not been even just physically connected because there's no way to safely walk from there or you can't get on the bus or there's no place to get good groceries there. Have those things or a way to get to those things. And at the same time, we're looking at our entire economy in a way that's going to be healthy for everybody here. And so that is to say, if you've got a business that you're running here that's doing well, we want that business to expand. If you're an entrepreneur and you're wanting to build something from the ground up, we're going to have to help you build that successfully from the ground up. If you're here on campus and you're in the research and development kind of world, whether that's around ag science or uh, human health or animal health or consumer products or uh, materials research, because there's fantastic stuff going on here at UGA in all of those fields, and you invent a thing that's going to make some money, I want you to produce and market that thing from right here in Athens and not feel like you've got to go to Boston or Austin or Silicon Valley or somewhere else. So um, I also want to make sure that as that happens, there are pipelines in for people. So. You know, whether you're a kid that was born here in Section 8 housing or a working class neighborhood, that you've got a way into those emerging and expanding industries. You know, that, that it's not just some folks who already had intellectual property doing even better, but it's people who, you know, right now might only have the option of getting into service work saying and having somebody actively engage with them and say, hey, you can spend nine months over at Athens Technical College and you can learn to code learn to do radiography or you can learn to do some entry-level laboratory work and you can get yourself from that service job that would have paid you $12 an hour to that entry-level entry laboratory job that would pay you $20 an hour you know and, and so we're kind of thinking holistically when we think economic development uh, now all these things aren't going to happen overnight and, and recognize that but part of the part of my job that's fun uh, but takes constant work is, is pulling in all those partners. You know, partners from the school district, partners from various offices here on campus, uh, uh, private sector partners, people in the development community. Uh, you know, when you come from a public sector and public education and uh, sort of social working background, you know, th those are different people to talk to. You know, I mean, it's different talking to a land planner or a big scale architect or somebody who does commercial property development, you know, than it is talking to somebody who, you know, who has kind of like that warm fuzzy thing that, that I've gotten used to people having where like, oh, it's all about love for the kids. So you have to have some different conversations. You learn some different languages that, that you know, there's in its own way, like almost a code switch when you go to talk to those groups. Um, the, the nice thing and, and the kind of interesting thing is that even when I talk to that kind of uh, that, that kind of population, that kind of crew, you know, you dig a little bit below the surface, you peel back some layers of the onion, and you find that, you know, maybe their first love was making a boatload of money on commercial real estate, but they've got some heart for people, you know. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, certainly in this country, everywhere I've gone, you know, you, you don't have to go too far to find somebody who's had mental health challenges in their family, you know, 
people that have kind of fallen into rough times. So you, know, you can usually engage even that crew, that business sector crew, in things around human capital and, uh, and, and social development. So that, that's kind of the sweet spot that I'm looking to get to, where the economy expands here, but it's going to be in a way that it expands for everybody and in a way that provides some help. Um, you know, some things even the Dr. Shiat and I have talked about over the last several months are doing some direct street outreach to the population that's always going to be here. You know, Athens is this hub in Northeast Georgia. Uh, folks come here for a good meal. People come here to listen to music. People come here to look at art. You know, people come here to become educated. People come here for health care services. And if they're hitting the skids and life is rough, they're not going to be hanging out in rural Oglethorpe County or Franklin County. They're going to be coming to Athens because here's where stuff is. And, and so I take it seriously that part of our role is helping people with that work, even if you've got addictions challenges or mental health challenges. So I'm um, engaged with kind of a group of folks around um, beginning as early as August, putting a team out there that's going to engage with people on the street uh, to make sure that even if, the, you know, we are talking earlier, even if the first couple of t times you see them, first 10 times you see them, their answer when you say, hey, we'd love to give you some resources, it's F you, that maybe it's that 11th time or that 21st time that they're like, well, you keep coming around, so that, that maybe you really need it. So that's, that's some tangible activity underway. Uh, some other activity underway is uh, kind of in the criminal justice frame. Uh, mentioned from many, many years ago, my undergrad was in criminal justice. And, uh, I've always been fascinated with that world, and certainly as an educator, had a lot of kids who themselves or through their families were criminal justice system engaged. Uh, and, and then particularly in this last professional role I had where I was working through prisons, you know, really saw kind of on a ground level basis just what that world was like, you know, and, and now I'm in the key position to recommend the you know, 130 million dollars that will come out of your tax dollars every year for expenditure, and, and how can we make sure that those are dollars well spent in a way that increases people's access to resources, dignifies people's humanity, and, and cuts crime at the same time. Um, and, and so some, some re-entry work, and then some pre-trial work are, are things that, that I'm engaged in right now that, that might be of particular interest to folks in the social world, uh, social work world, excuse me. So, and yeah, real interesting stuff. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from you guys. And it doesn't matter how big picture and lofty or kind of how tiny and small and granular. Um, uh, you know, how many of you are from around Athens, Athens or surrounding areas? Anybody from, from right around here? All right, so a couple of folks who actually know the back streets of this town. Um, who, who's from Georgia, at least? Uh, you get a, uh, who's from outside the state? Came here from. Oh, far away. All right. All right. So that yeah, gives, gives me baseline. So you, you guys come here from some other places in the state, some other places uh, around the country, around the globe. What, 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 what do you think about Athens? What, what strikes your fancy? Yeah. I have a question. Lots of things I love about Athens, and I live in Winterville. Lots of things I love about Winterville yeah. and everything going on there. But um, because of your background in education. Um, and because of the school voucher thing that just kind of uh, made its through. way through, I wonder how you're thinking about that. So our schools, you know, the sort of issue we have with uh, segregation in our schools, mm -hmm. the way that overlaps with private schools, and this question of how vouchers are coming in, you're more on the ground with that. I wonder if you'd say more about how you think about Sure. Um, you know, that... Uh, uh, the, the, the voucher conversation that happens, you know, I'll just say frankly, kind of in conservative policy making circles right. is something of a big red herring. In that, I think the way it's sold is to say, hey, I will give you this voucher so that your kid doesn't need to go to the crappy public school down the street, but your kid can go anywhere to, to a great private school. You know, the reality is, though, that that private school can still admit or deny you. And that private school still is a place where you will have to <coughs> transport your kid. There's not going to be a bus that picks your kid up there like there is from the public school. And what that also means, of course, is that you're disinvesting in the public school system. Right. And, and, and I'm a person who believes in 
some things being important shared resources, and, and among them public education, uh, I mean, I would add healthcare to that list, but uh, that, that ain't happening yet, but we'll see where we go. Um, so, I mean, th th those are a couple of the, uh, of the challenges with the red herring that is the voucher world. Um, and, and now there are all of these other things historically that have been true, and certainly here. So look at Athens, that's interesting. So, uh, Brown versus Board of Education comes in two waves in 1954 and 1955. Um, Athens doesn't truly integrate its public schools until 1971, so 17 years after the first Brown rule, long enough for somebody to be born and go all the way through school. Uh, so, curiously, in Athens, and, and if, if anybody's interested in some more of this history, there was a Georgia State student who did a great dissertation on this history about five years ago. I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, Despite segregation and despite being resource starved, the black schools in Athens were community hubs of engagement and of interaction and warmth and love. They had crappy textbooks that were like 15 years ago textbooks. The facilities were crap. But there at least was sort of a lot of love there from the community. When Athens transitioned to an integrated school system, Everybody got good textbooks, but that community engaged part of what had happened with the high school, Bernie Harris High, was long. Um, throughout the South, private schools opened up en masse in the late 60s and early 1970s. So you look at Athens history, Athens Academy opens 1967, uh, Athens Christian School opens 1971. I mean, these things are no mystery. Um, and, and you also begin to see so sort of, you know, white flight and money flight. Um, and, and so that, you know, that, that really dogged not only this school system, but lots of school systems for a long time. Um, if you look at the population of this county, of Athens Clark County, all through the 1980s and all through the 1990s, growing. More people, more people, more people. But if you look at the population of the school district all through the 1980s and 90s, it was flat. 12,000 kids. Because what was happening, either people were sending their kids to private school, or as soon as they were making babies, they were moving. What I can say really proudly and happily is that over the last 10 years, while we've continued to see the local population grow, we've also seen the school district population grow. So the school district population is north of 14,000 kids, 2,000 more than we were here 10 years ago. So that means there's this increasing confidence. And, and, and in a way, I think, there is this thing that we really have captured here in Athens that we need to capture more of around you know, people of means saying, you know, we're doubling down on our local school system. We're saying this is where we want to raise our kids. And I think there are enough conscious people here who said, you know what, you know, I've been hearing and the data will tell you that two-thirds of your kids' educational outcomes are about what happens in your family and what's going on in your neighborhood. Taking your kid to the museum, if you're reading to your kid at home, if you're doing cool stuff with your kid, I mean, they got to be doing crazy bad stuff in public school for that to do some damage. I mean, that's, that's the reality. And, and, and the data would, would bear that out. Um, if you've not looked at any of her work, there's a great researcher and writer, Nicole Hannah Jones, who I would recommend to you, Nicole with a K, Nicole hyphenated Hannah Jones. She's done a lot of work on this. She writes for New York Times Magazine and the kind of online public affairs journal ProPublica. Um, Richard Rothstein is an economist and sociologist who's written about some of this stuff. It, you know, so, I mean, Athens has recognized this, but I, mean, I think we need to continue to sort of beat the bandwagon. You know, part of uh, Hannah and Nicole Jones' work is also about segregation in public education. She's written a lot about how, you know, you got through the late 80s and schools were getting more and more and more and more integrated. And 1988 was peak integration in the United States, and we've been declining in terms of racial integration in public education since 1988. Um, 
And in Athens, the way that that's shown its head is that there are, you know, like if you would ask a real estate agent, there are good elementary schools, and then you don't want to live there. You know, and, that, and that's the way, if you talk to somebody who's looking for a home, they'll talk to you, and I'm seeing some nods, like you've heard these conversations. Um, so my goal, and I met with the superintendent of schools twice this week as a conversation about some collaborative work, is to turn that conversation to the point where 10 years from now, people think, you know, anywhere in Athens is a great place to be. You know, anywhere in Athens is well resourced. Anywhere in Athens, your kid is going to be well in elementary school. And yeah, there's a long answer to a short question. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, what else is on your mind? I know you spoke about bridging the gap economically. I'm just wondering what exactly are the strategies as far as like affordable housing. I know that there's like a SPLAS. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know that there's like a SPLAS proposal. I'm just wondering where you stand. Sure. Um, uh, well, so, in answer to this question, I, I'll give another little historical sketch. So, if, if you went back even to 1950, uh, wealthy folks and poor folks weren't very far apart in Athens. Um, it wasn't unusual. Like so, let's think about today's drive down Prince Avenue. All right, uh, you would have a bunch of very wealthy people on Prince Avenue proper in big old grand homes, and then you'd have some working class folks, black and white, living on some of the side streets in small homes. Well, what's happened is that as Athens has moved, um, so poor folks have gotten ghettoized in enclaves. Some of them geographically very distinct. And some places that used to have that mix of working class and wealth have gone all wealth. So, you know, I mean, I uh, challenge you to drive down Prince Avenue and take a right turn anywhere between here and the loop and find a house for less than $300,000 because it ain't there. And if it is there, it's a $300,000 house that's got the roof falling in that's going to be a teardown and rebuilding that's going to have a million dollars on So, you know, I, I kind of recognize some of these educational dynamics that we talked about before, and I'm trying to think, what can we do to see, like, greatest integration, essentially deconstruct those ghettoized places, and also think about these questions of displacement. Um, you, let's look at Atlanta as an interesting model. So Atlanta has seen the median income within the city of Atlanta increase, and Atlanta's seen a lot of places that 20 years ago you know, we scared the Jesus out of folks at 10 o'clock at night, become like all these highfalutin great places, East Lake, you know, and you know, they're written about in national journals. But what also happened is that thousands of people who had been living in Atlanta proper through all this revitalization moved into the Cab County and then Rockdale County and then Newton County. So you've got people who are now 40 miles from where they started 20 years ago and they're not in places that are walkable, they're not in places where you go get a bag of fresh groceries, they're not in places with public transit, they're not in places where medical facilities are close by. So as I think about affordable housing needs, I'm trying to think, how do we make those transitions from those dramatically under-resourced areas? And in Athens, the most under-resourced areas really are a lot of the privately held Section 8 developments, your Bethel Homes, your Athens Gardens, if you're familiar with that neighborhood on the east side, your Rolling Ridges, some of your trailer park communities. So how do we rebuild those in a way that they're mixed income and well-resourced and also geographically close to resources? So um, two big tools that I'm in the midst of employing right now. One is this loss package that uh, will be about $45 million over nine or 10 years to do that kind of redevelopment. The other uh, will be a tool that also you can use for general economic development uh, called a tax allocation district and that was written about the paper a little bit this weekend. And uh, that's actually what Atlanta has used to do the Beltline area and Atlantic Station where the IKEA is. And that's where you kind of draw a line or a box on the map and you say, all right, inside this box, any new investment we're going to let the new tax dollars that that new investment drives for a limited period of time go back into the box instead of going to the whole county. All right, so you set a baseline. You say, all right, if $10,000 from that box is going to the county now, that's going to continue for the next 20 years. But if there's an additional $500,000 that's going to begin going to the county, let's keep that in this box 
for infrastructure building for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years to do a real good job building stuff out. And that building out can include affordable or mixed income housing uh, resources. So I'm, I'm looking at both those tools as ways to get to some of that sweet spot. Do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I was um, kind of, you spoke to some of this a little bit, but I was interested in hearing what your thoughts are in terms of the town down relations, the relationship between UGA and the community, how we can address and bridge some of the issues related to race, racism. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, uh, of course, it was about town down relations. You, you know, the, one of the things that I have kind of realized is that, you know, UGA is not a monolith, right? Like most institutions are, you know. I mean, it, you know, it's got a hierarchy, and you know, there's a president, and then a statewide board of regents that sets policy for the university. Um, but there are a lot of people in different offices all over this campus doing different things. You know, uh, the history department is not as same as the administrative office. The uh, uh, financial aid office isn't the same as the school of social work. So there are some times when I engage with the university on that big administrative level, and I reach out to uh, President Moorhead or his office. And there are times when I reach out individually to folks on campus. Um, you know, I'll say my, uh, my observation from 20 years of working with kids and families is that there are a lot of families in this town who've been here for generations who, if you ask them, would kind of look at UGA like the foreign country, as if you need them as a passport to get on campus. I mean, I think that's been I mean, on a gut level sort of the vibe from some folks. And, um, you know, I mean, certainly you, you look at the long historical thread of UGA and who's going to UGA, and it, it's folks with money. And it's a lot of white folks. You know, I think UGA is African American student population, something about 7% of the population right now, obviously. Uh, Athens, African-American populations are 30%, it's near there in the state, you know, so you see that disparity, and so I, having worked with high school kids, you know, I often have had that conversation with kind of high-flying African-American high school kids who've said, you know, I know I get into UGA, but I'm not sure I want to go there, I might feel just better at Georgia State, you know, and, and, and I hate that that's the case. So. Everything that can be done over a period of time to kind of bridge that gap would make me a happier person. Uh, there obviously is this long, ongoing conversation uh, with UGA about its sort of historical legacy. Um, I, I think they need to manage that. I, I think that needs to be well handled. Uh, you can look at University of Virginia, and even go further south, University of South Carolina, and University of Mississippi. You know, I mean, there have been some specific things that those schools have done that aren't even things where they've expended dollars. They're just things where they've said, hey, we want the historical record to be clear, and, and we want to be in a sort of academic space around that conversation. I, I, I would wish that you, the university would take those steps, um, and, and everybody on campus knows that, so it's no mystery, no secret. Um, they, as I referenced earlier, have a governing group, the Board of Regents, 20-member group appointed by the governor, you know, I think that's that's where you really have to go. I, I think that's the, the you know that that's who can turn that dial. Anybody knows anybody on the board of regents or knows anybody, <laughs> knows anybody on the board of regents? God bless you. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, I mean, you, you asked about the university town down relations, but I'm also thinking about town government relations, town local government relations. And, um, you know, I could talk about the university all day long, and there were some things that I would wish for. And some of those things are underway. I mean, you know, you look at the engagement with local public school district, you know, some of the work that's already happening in the innovation zone and that is coming. I mean, there's some fantastic things happening. Um, but, but, but I have to kind of, I always have to turn the spotlight on myself and think, like, well, what, what are we doing? And so uh, here in Athens, we're going to be opening an office of uh, inclusion and diversity this summer. Uh, part of that work is our own historical reckoning. And also some internal work with our department heads and our staff. And then lots of external work so that our fingers get out to the community. And that we're not just hosting meetings downtown, but we're going out to neighborhoods where people are and having conversations. So, you know, I, I mean, it's, 
I, I don't feel like I'm in a position to point fingers. I'm in a position to look, look inwardly at, at the organization that I'm helping. And so hoping to do as much as possible there. And if that serves as inspiration for some other community institutions, that'd be great. That helps. Um, this weekend, I, a friend of mine from a long time ago brought a daughter here. She said, I'm going to be great. And they asked me about Athens. You know, and I have to apply. And I love Athens. I moved here uh, over 20 years ago. I think I'm still here. But it was kind of hard for me to get the feel of Athens across when we're downtown surrounded by giant condominiums. You know? and, uh, and I had a student here just recently who said he went to all those places looking for a place and couldn't afford any of them. I mean, and that's not bridging any gaps, of course. And I know that they're made for students, but please tell me they're not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I kind of recognize that every economic trend sort of has its arc of activity. And we're, if not fully built out, just about as built out as we can be right now for that sort of high-end undergrad uh, domicile. Now, uh, for me, it's it's not, I don't want kids downtown or living downtown. I mean, because it has some real benefits. So, I mean, just a couple things. Environmentally, that means that there are fewer kids driving cars, and that's great. <laughs> Um, you know, on the public safety front, our DUIs are down by 50% over the last decade. Uh, you know, some of that's ride sharing, your lifts and your Ubers, but some of that's, you know, stumbling back to your apartment at the standard ra rather, than, uh, ra rather than getting behind the wheel and driving over Cedar Shoals Drive. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, th th there's some utility in what we've got. I, I just don't want downtown to be a student-only zone. You know, I, I want to think, you know, what can we do to <laughs> introduce, you know, professional class housing, that we introduce senior housing, mm -hmm. you know, you know all, all kinds of things. So that, that's sort of my vision of particularly the downtown ring is to say this is a space for everybody. Yeah, so I'm involved in some very particular projects or in some revitalization that would bring some of that. Uh, another project that's a senior specific project that I hope gets off the ground. Um, uh, a parks project in downtown that could prospectively be not only great uh, central green space, but uh, might have something like a splash pad or a kids area too, just so that you know when you're downtown, it's not one color, one flavor. Yeah. And here we're going to have hopefully. I mean, I don't know, this is across the street. Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, and the, and the the one across the street, and I mean, everybody's got different architectural preferences. Mm -hmm. You know, but one of the things that I think people find interesting about the old parts of downtown Athens is there's sort of like a funkiness and a lack of uniformity. And with some of those condos, you've got 10 acres where it's all uniform, where it feels like the thing got flown in from the moon and <laughs> dropped on the earth. And the cool thing about the one that's uh, scheduled for right across the street from where we're sitting is that it is a little bit kind of funkier and, and, and not as totally, totally cookie cutter. And they said it would be it would appeal to more moderate people that can't afford to pay for right. oh. like graduate students and professional people. Maybe to that. Is there ever any talk she said selfishly? Uh, <laughs> thinking about these developments and thinking about spaces for university collaborations around <laughs> projects with the town, with the people in the modern housing. Mm -hmm. I can see there could be some really interesting spaces for services, collaboration, for the arts, and things like that, where the university and the town come together with something. Yeah, uh, particularly in the economic development world. I mean, so if you're not familiar with the innovation district concept, it's the idea that you take something that's going on in a, in a laboratory here in 200 square feet, you move into 500 square feet with a couple of lab assistants and get it kind of ready for market. And our idea is to move it to market and keep it here, reference some of that earlier. An interesting thing that um, could be a great opportunity is in some of this community revitalization that I referenced earlier, let's say you take, let's say you take an acreage that right now is exclusively dramatically poor. 40% of median income, 
or less. Everybody there is earning $10,000 a year or nothing. And let's say you revitalize that and it becomes a denser, slightly taller, mixed income environment where you still have the same number of people living there who are making $10,000 a year or nothing. And you introduce some people who are making 30 grand a year and 80 grand a year. Now, that's gonna be almost by definition a safer place because it's gonna have more eyes on the ground, it's gonna be better resourced. But I think you can't stop there. You know, the literature would suggest that some of what you need to do is you need to talk about, well, what's, what transitional services are you providing for those families who are still making $0 or $10,000 a year? How are you getting them accustomed to living in a new kind of space, in a new kind of setting? How are you making sure that you're keeping them in the pipeline to become those $30,000 earners or higher earners? And, and, and so that might be a real good opportunity to look for some of that. Yeah, when I was in South Carolina, there was a project where um, they were, some of our faculty worked with a public housing project and were giving one of the spaces and creating a community empowerment center that was totally run by the individuals and they did art projects and they did mini grants where the community members themselves had to come up with sustainable projects. So they did things like sent one of the community members to learn how to be a robots instructor so they could have a robots classes every day there in the building. Just different things that would revitalize the community that the community owned that wasn't BGA coming in and the BGA not yeah. at all. Yeah, right. That's a great idea. If, uh, if you guys had to think, all right, here's Athens, I'm having a pretty good time here. Uh, of course, an unparalleled academic experience. Um, but here are a couple things that I would like to see infused or added or fixed in Athens. But what would some of those be? Trying to win. Trying to win. Always. Get rid of cash bonds, go to jail, decriminalize marijuana to help bridge the gap for the communities that are being targeted there. So that work underway now. Mm -hmm. Seems like communication needs to be better between the different mm -hmm. sectors. Like you were saying, bridging the gap, a lot of that is just people aren't aware of what each other is doing, mm -hmm. which is frustrating. Yeah. Are, are, are any of you, or have you heard of the Envision Athens? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, program so so envision is intended to be that hub and uh, it, it's only been a staffed office for nine months so if you haven't heard of it that's all right uh, fewer than that actually so uh, we are bound by kind of state law as a government local government to do something uh, uh, called a comprehensive plan every 10 years and um, we have to think about land use but we have to think about community programming and community community resources and what needs to be added or tweaked or modified or infused with some new life. And so what we elected to do was engage with some of our partners, technical college, the hospitals, the university, the school district, to make sure that we were all thinking about this together. And now what we've done is we've hired uh, Aaron Barber, who's our Envision Athens Executive Director, to kind of always be at the center of the table, pulling people in together. So rather than having to rely on a random conversation that I have with somebody in the school district when I run into them in the grocery store, we have intentional conversations that are around, uh, I think there are 14 topical areas where it's sort of different clusters of people, just to get at that point. And, and you know, I think it's true in any community. There are very well-meaning people who happen not to be in the same room at the same time who need to be, who ought to be. And, and so this is an effort to, to get us there and to keep us there. Yes. <coughs> I hope the fire to that trail doesn't lose steam before it gets to winter roll. No, I, I think it will not lose steam. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're good. It's uh, it's going to be built from both ends, right? Yeah. So the winter roll proper segment. Yeah. yeah. And, I think we'll dawn about it every time I see it. Good, good, good. No, he's easily pickable. Pickable. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, it's, it's going to get fully built. Thanks so much for being here, for your, your comments. 
Um, what's your wish list for what engagement looks like for people that have been in Athens for generations, for people that came for learning and stayed for love, for people that are here for 40 years and want to go away? Like what, what ideally would you like to see and do you need to carry forward the agenda that you just described that sure. is really exciting for me to hear as an Athens citizen? Um, well, some of it is for those different clusters that you mentioned to be in some of the same spaces. Okay. You know, for, for there not to be, you know, like a middle-aged guy place where I go have a beer, and, and, and for there to be, um, you know, places where 25-year-olds go to have a beer, and places where multi-generational locals don't feel like they belong at all. So, you know, some of it is, uh, you know, I mean, I mentioned those kind of physical connections, like how do we just get people to resources? You know, I was having conversations actually with Eric Barber this morning, uh, with me a month later. You know, there are places where there's not going to be a grocery store built in this right. town just because there's not the return on investment to make that happen. So how do we at least make sure it's easy to get to the grocery store, yeah. for example? So, so I think a lot about those physical connections, but I also think about the social connections. How do we build a town that is, you know, more the soup and less the salad? You know, we got a lot of different folks in town, and, and, and that's great, and I like that, but how often are people from those different spaces really engaging with each other? And now that's a big ask, and, and, and I don't know exactly what the journey between here and there looks like, but when I go to an historically African-American church, I'm having, you know, Great, upfilling, uplifting, fulfilling time. I think like I'm the only white dude in this space, and uh, you know, I mean, they often say the most segregated hour is 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning, right? Um, and so maybe that's the extreme example, but just in general, I would like there to be a more co-mingling um, in a bunch of ways, and, and again, you know, just better resourced all around. So you know, you look at some of those indicators, just the monetary indicators. I'd like to think that in 10 years' time, 40% of our youth under 18 aren't living in poverty. Um, and I think we can cut that. Uh, you know, and I realize that if I do my work the best I possibly can and draw together people and don't burn bridges and all that kind of stuff, you know, I'm going to be passing the baton to somebody else because it's not all going to get done in eight years. Um, but I at least want to set up a foundation that somebody else can build on. So, so that metric is meaningful to me. Um, getting people graduate from high school is a meaningful metric. You know, that's the school system's formal job, but you know, we play a role. Uh, getting people from high school into post-secondary ed and into the workplace, that's a, that's a meaningful metric. Um, you know, so I think a lot about you know, what, what does the Athens economy on the macro level look like 10 years from now? Have we just grown the service sector? Are there just more people working, but they're still just asking, hey, do you want fries with that hamburger? Mm -hmm. I don't want that to be the case. You know, I want to think, you know, the median income isn't $34,000, but it's $54,000. There's a few. Yeah. There's a great set of um, my articles about community and schools a couple months ago. Um, you know, the down from the superintendent of right. the community school people. Can you talk a little bit about communities and schools um, and how that model might be used to happen? Sure. So, so, so there is, of course, a national nonprofit named communities and yeah. schools. And, and then there's generally the concept, how do, um, how do you have a school system that's kind of community engaged? And I would say by that, engaged with other big institutions too. Um, and, and that's kind of a two-way street. It takes a school district that's open. Um, and it also takes community members who are willing to endeavor to have conversations with people in the school system. And uh, it, it always takes a level of compromise. You know, uh, any big institution, especially a public institution, has just some formal needs and formal requirements. And so outsiders who say, like, oh, I really want to help in the school system, have to be conscious of those formal requirements. You know, um, I, I managed volunteers for a long time, and you know, those folks have to get background checks. You know, and that, that's a thing. And, and, 
And so realizing that there are all those hitches is important for individuals who say, I want to go be engaged. And that's just one example, but there are a hundred others. And also there's got to be a willingness to say from the institutional perspective, in this case the school district perspective, hey, we want some support. And we realize we're a stronger institution when we've got some partners than when we're just operating on our own. So uh, I, I, uh, I, mean, I read both those pieces and familiar with them and friends with both those guys. And while, um, you know, while I think in the plain reading of those two uh, kind of op-ed pieces, you know, you might have felt some dissimilarity or some tension. Um, my, my experience in life is that time is short. Time is short. And so let's spend some time talking about those areas of overlap. You know, that, that Venn diagram where we're both getting some needs met. You know, where we're all getting something out of this. Because heaven knows, you, you know, you spend a lot of energy fussing and a lot of energy talking about where you don't match up, but I'm not going to do this very long. I want to spend my energy on building things together. So I, I think we're I think we're getting there, and we're going to continue to get there. You know, and I'll say, you know, Dr. Means is still relatively new to his job. Uh, Athens, as we have kind of noted through this long conversation, is is complex, and there are a bunch of facets of Athens. And you know, you, you can spend your whole life living on one of those facets and kind of thinking, oh, that's all of Athens. You know, blind to there being all these other things. Or, or you know, and, and not out of any willful blindness, but just because, hey, that's where you live. You know, I, uh, I think about, you know, it's kind of a referencing that earlier thing. There's some people here for four years. I would wish that people who were here for four years would experience more of those facets. Uh, I, I mean, I, Constantly, I'm appealing to people who do freshman orientation to say, let me talk, just give me 10 minutes. Okay, you can't give me 10 minutes in orientation. Give me 10 minutes in October, just give me something. And it's hard to kind of break in because I want somebody who's 19, 18, living here for the first time to get kind of a, a wider aperture than just that narrow frame of dorm, class, downtown. My fake ID guy. You know, just a little, a little more than that. Just a little more than that. All right. I think uh, time is uh, time is short. I'm going to go get a bite to eat. And uh, it's really good seeing you. I'm easy to find. Um, if any of you would like to talk more, call over. I'd be glad to sit down. Um, my email, phone number on the web. Um, come on around. But thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you.